privilege uh, to introduce uh, uh, for this webinar. Actually, sir needs uh, no introduction. Uh, sir is the professor and head uh, department of uh, reproductive medicine and surgery, Sri Ramchandra Institute of uh, Higher Education and Research in Chennai. Uh, sir started the first uh, super specialty course that is uh, MCH in reproductive medicine and surgery in India. Sir is the recipient of many awards, including Dr. B.C. Roy National Award in uh, 2015 as an eminent medical teacher. Sir also received the Distinguished uh, Faculty Award in Chennai. Sir is the expert uh, panel member of uh, uh, to, to Medical Council of India to formulate syllabi and minimum eligibility criteria for MCH in reproductive medicine and surgery course. Sir is also a board member of Reproductive Medicine of uh, National Board of Examination. Sir is a member of the committee to prepare syllabi for fellowship in reprodu reproductive medicine and fellowship in clinical embryology to NTR University of Health Sciences in Vijayawada, Andhra Pradesh. Sir is an honorary consultant and external board member of JIPMED and helps uh, to establish IVF uh, center at JIPMED. Founder Secretary of Tamil Nadu and the Pondicherry Chapter of ISA, also past President of Option Gynecological Society of Southern India in 2010 and Chennai. Organizing Secretary of All India Congress of Option Gynecologists uh, in 2015 and Chennai. Organizing Secretary of uh, Indian Society for Assisted Reproductive Annual Conference, that's ISAR in 2015 and Chennai and also organizing uh, secretary of indian society for assisted reproduction annual conference in chennai in 2018 so with this uh, may i request and invite sir uh, for his talk on male factor infertility options beyond hc and donor sperm usage so thank you sir and over to you thank you prachi for our kind introduction at the outset, I would like to thank the Shield Healthcare, particularly Mr. Balaji for inviting me and share some of my thoughts with you all today. I'm going to speak on recent advances in the management of male factor infertility, options beyond ICSI and donor sperm usage. Infertility is a prevalent condition affecting an estimated 70 million people globally. The WHO estimates that 9% of couples worldwide struggle with fertility issues and that male factor contributes to 50% of the issues. Many genetic and lifestyle factors have been implicated in male infertility. However, about 30% of cases are still thought to be idiopathic. The cornerstone in evaluation of male infertility is semen analysis. Semen samples can provide valuable information about the fertility of the male in certain situations. It does have several limitations. Males with poor quality sperm could conceive when their relative subparity is compensated by a young female with a high probability of conception. How to approach to male infertility? You have to take detailed history and thorough examination. It will give us an idea whether he is not normal or abnormal. Suppose if he is abnormal, treat that abnormality, there is a chance that they can become pregnant. If there is no abnormality, then we have to advise the semen analysis. It may be normal or abnormal. If it is normal, then we have to think of sperm function test. If there is any fertilization failure, other things we can make out. Suppose if it is abnormal, it may be azospermia or oligosteinoterosospermia. Then depending upon the condition, you may have to do the hormonal assay and genetic evaluation like karyotyping and Y chromosome micro deletions. Suppose in words, if there is no, everything is normal, then we'll call it as idiopathic male infertility. There we can treat medical management. We cannot give 100% guarantee. There is a, some patient they can improve. Suppose if it is azospermia, then we can go for the FNS, fine needle aspiration cytology or testicular biopsy to differentiate whether it is obstructive azospermia or non-obstructive azospermia. If it is obstructive azospermia, depending upon the site and size of uh, block, we can either do microsurgery or we can go for the ART procedure. In case of non-obstructive azospermia, we can go for the micro TZ. Up to 50 to 60 percent of patients, we can get the sperms. With that, we can go for the ICSI. Or if the patient decided to go for the 
donor insemination or adoption, that option also is available. Usually, when the semen analysis comes, even if the sperm parameters are normal, then three to four times we'll do the IVA. If the patient is not conceiving, just directly we'll go for IVF or ICSI. Same way, if it is votes, just like that, if it's borderline is there, we'll do three times or four times IVA. If it is not there, then we'll go for the ICSI. Is there any other way we can avoid ICSI and we can, by modifying some of the conditions, whether we'll be able to make the patient to conceive naturally, or if there is a, it is not improving, then we can go and stop directly, earlier it's up going. So if normal parameters are there, there are two conditions that is, can affect the fertility. One is reactive oxygen spe, oxidative species. Next is DNA fragmentation. Next, if it is votes, here there is a chance is there with the medical therapy, we can improve the sperm count and other parameters. Then there is a chance is that patient can, can become pregnant. If it's varicose is, uh, is there, if you exclude all other causes for fertility in the both female and male, then if you do the surgery, varicose surgery, there is a chance is there the sperm can count can improve and patient can become pregnant. When it comes to the azospermia, just like that we are advising um, donor insemination or adoption. So if you go into the depth, if you make out whether there is obstructive azospermia is there or non-obstructive azospermia, obstructive by taking the sperms from the testes, you can do the ICSI. Non-obstructive until now, we are thinking like that, there is no chance at all for this patient. We will advise them either donor insemination or other, um, adoption. Nowadays, the invention of the micro TZ makes a lot of difference. Up to 70% of the patients, you can get the um, sperms even if the FSH levels are very high, 40, 50 is there also you can get. So for them, if it's not, we can try some of the medical therapy, so then it will improve. And also there are newer treatment modalities like intratestical injection of PRP, stem cell therapy, artificial gametes are available. We will see each one separately. Role of oxidative stress in male infertility, Oxidative stress is defined as an imbalance between the production of reactive oxygen species and the scavenging capacity of available antioxidants resulting in redox paradox. Sperm cells are vulnerable to ROS because of the abundance of polyunsaturated fatty acids in their plasma membrane and cytoplasm and limited antioxidant capacity and DNA repair system. Certain levels of ROS are required for maturation of spermatozoa, acrosome reaction, capacitation, hyperactivation, and sperm oocyte fusion. Increased ROS along with decreased antioxidant defense result in redox imbalance, reduced sperm motility, and leads to sperm DNA damage. ROS promote peroxidation of lipids, resulting in intracellular oxidative burden. The sequence of events involved in lipid peroxidation loss of membrane integrity with increased permeability, reduced sperm motility, structural DNA damage, and apoptosis. Several intrinsic and extrinsic factors have been associated with increased oxidative stress in the male reproductive system. We we'll see this one, we will have, there may be external factors like age, lifestyle, estrogen, stress, genital infections, malignancy, toxins, radiation, chemotherapy, or smoking, alcohol, if the patient is obese, this all leads to increased ROS. And also intrinsic factors like cellular metabolism, varicocele, immature sperms, increased WBC count also leads to increased ROS. So there is imbalance between the oxidants and antioxidants re resulting in the increase in oxidative stress. This leads to sperm DNA fragmentation, cross-linking of chromosomal anomalies, micro DNA damage, impaired fertilization, infertility, recurrent miscarriages, genetic diseases, childhood malignancy, reduced sperm motility, sperm membrane, lipid peroxidation. These are the problems we will get because of increased ROS. So there are two types of antioxidants are available. One is an enzymatic and non-enzymatic antioxidants. Superoxide desmidase, catalase, and glutathione peroxides are enzymatic antioxidants. Vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C, vitamin B, and glutathione peroxidase, coenzyme Q10, carnitine, 
and minerals like zinc copper selenium and chromium are non enzymatic antioxidants what are the pathological effects of increased ros on male fertility sperm characteristics were significantly lower in infertile men with high levels of ros alter dna integrity in the sperm nucleus by inducing breakage of dna strands base modifications and chroma chromatin cross linking spermatozoa have limited different mechanisms against ros induced dna damage oxidase stress could induce a rapid loss of intracellular atp resulting in axonemal damage with a decreased permeability and mobility increased mid piece structural defects with a deleterious effects on sperm capacitation and the acrosome reaction lipid lipid peroxidation of the sperm membrane is a key mediator of ros induced sperm damage leading to infertility what are the anti accidents available for treating these conditions vitamin c vitamin e these two are the best and other things like coenzyme q10 ni style cysteine carnitine trace elements such as zinc selenium pentaxphalan and many times these all mix like the combination of these four antigens can be given to treat these conditions we will see what is the evidence there is a review article role of oxidative stress in male infertility published in 2019 from iraq the conclusion of the review is although ros are essential for some reproductive processes such as capacitation and acrosome reaction increased ros along with decreased anti accident defense results in oxidative stress status which ultimately leads to sperm membrane lipid peroxidation reduced motility sperm dna damage poor pregnancy and art outcomes and increased risk of genetic diseases in offspring various diagnostic and therapeutic options have been developed for oxidative stress however there is lack of agreement on selecting there are so many tests are there but there is no lack of agreement on selecting which test is best and type and duration of anti anti accident treatment as well as on defining the target patient group by giving anti accidents we can also definitely 100% improvement will be there so further studies are warranted to overcome these limitations improve fertility potential and reduce the risk of genetic diseases and malignant tumors in newborns even if you cannot say like 100% improvement it is not harming anything so that we can give this uh, to the patients for 3 to 4 months so that there is a chance here there it can do good things then we'll go to sperm dna fragmentation sperm dna fragmentation testing measures the quality of sperm as a dna package carrier dna damage such as fragmentation and dna saturation can have adverse effects on fertilization and embryo development and can cause infertility infertile men have a greater extent of sperm dna damage and poorer sperm dna integrity than fertile men and the fertilization of dna damaged spermatozoa can increase the risk of genetic diseases in the offspring so if you see here here also we will have extrinsic factors and intrinsic factor the causes for the sperm dna fragmentation in extrinsic factors we have primary pathologies of male reproductive system systemic pathologies environmental lifestyle factors like drugs smoking pollution radiation leads to increased oxidative stress same way systemic pathologies like cancer diabetes systemic infection will leads to increase the oxidative stress same way primary pathologies of male reproductive system like varicocele prolonged stasis during epididymal transmit immature abnormal spermatozoa will lead to abortive apopto apoptosis and defective maturation which leads the vulnerable sperm to have increased sperm dna fragmentation this leads to infertility impaired reproductive outcomes even if you go for iui ivf for ixi increased risk for genetic and birth defects what is the evidence for dna fragmentation effect on the pregnancy rate the role of uh, sperm dna fragmentation male factor infertility a systemic review published in arab journal of urology the authors are from hong kong and usa here what are the indications clinical indications where they advised testing if there is 
increased sperm DNA fragment test testing is recommended in patient with grade two, three varicocele with normal conventional seminal parameters. Even if the seminal analysis is normal, if they have grade three, grade two or grade three varicocele, then that is an indication. If the <coughs> SDF testing is recommended in patient with grade one varicocele also, if there is a borderline abnormal conventional sperm, if there is some problem is there with the semen analysis, even grade one we will advise them to do the SDF testing. Next is unexplained infertility or she had failure, IUA failure or recurrent pregnancy lot. Here also we will advise them to undergo this uh, SDF testing. Next is IV of a RICSI failures also, this is also an indication, or borderline abnormal semen parameters with risk factors should also be, up. that is modifiable risk factors like diabetes or smoking or alcohol, if the husband is taking this type of things, if we modify, here also we have to advise them to go. These are the things they tried, like short abstinence, oral anti-accident therapy, varicocelectomy, sperm selection techniques like MAX, MC, PIXC. Next is preparation also, they change density gradient, centrifugation, swim up technique. Or sometimes they say like this stuff, ejaculated sperm. If you take the sperm directly from the testes that have less DNA fragmentation problem. So, and these are the assays available. I was telling there are so many assays are there. We cannot definitely say this is best or this is, whichever is available we can use. So in conclusion of this review, numerous studies have shown the relationship between SDF and reproductive outcomes in natural conception and assisted reproduction. Even the patient conceives, the miscarriage rate is very high if they have increased DNA fragmentation index. Recent support evidence of effective treatment strategies in managing high SDF further consolidate the role of SDF testing in the management of male factor infertility. Although there is insufficient evidence for routine SDF testing for the evaluation of infertile men, several specific clinical indications have been proposed based on the current best evidence. This represents the important step forward in promoting the wider clinical application of SDF testing and facilitating future clinical research in male infertility. Another article published in the Asian Journal of Andrology a systematic review and meta-analysis to determine the effect of sperm DNA damage on IVF and ICSI. You see here, they tested the effect of DNA damage on clinical pregnancy rate in IVF, <coughs> clinical pregnancy rate in ICSI, and mixed also, like both IVF together also they have checked. Here, the conclusion of the study in this systematic review and meta-analysis we have found a modest but statistically significant detrimental effect of sperm DNA damage and clinical pregnancy rate after IVF, ICSI are mixed also. So definitely there is decreased pregnancy rate. Although the adverse effect of sperm DNA damage and clinical pregnancies was observed in all three treatment groups, this effect appears to vary according to the type of assay used to measure sperm DNA damage. Next, another thing in fertility and sterility, Reproductive outcome, I was telling, you know, like uh, even if you use the ejaculated sperm, the DNA fragmentation index is very high. When you go for the ICSI also, the pregnancy rate will be affected. So that they have tried taking sperm directly from the testes. So there is a paper here, reproductive outcomes of testicular versus ejaculated sperm for intraspitous or the ICSI with high levels of DNA fragmentation in seven systematic review meta-analysis. Here, sperm DNA fragmentation rates between testicular and ejaculated sperm. Here they have seen the ejaculated sperm is having more DNA, uh, sperm DNA fragmentation. And the fertilization rate, they have seen the fertilization is better with testicular sperm when compared with the ejaculated sperm. Next is pregnancy rate also is better with the testicular directly to the extracted the sperms from the test is than the ejaculated sperm. And also the miscase rate is higher in ejaculated sperm when compared with the testicular sperm for its use. And live birth rate also is higher in testicular sperm than the ejaculated sperm. The conclusion of the review is 
testicular sperm have lower levels of SDF than ejaculated sperm with the testicular ICSI for high post-testicular death. So the advice to go for the testicular ICSI than the ejaculated thing. Infertile couples may benefit from testicular ICSI if male partners have confirmed high SDF in the ejaculate. Next, we'll see the varicocele management. There are various, this is going to be a controversial topic. Some papers say there is no effect. Some papers say there definitely effect is there. We'll see what the evidence says. The role, role of varicocele repair for male infertility in the era of ART. The rates of, so there are various ways of uh, doing the operation, like high ligation, inguinal approach, subinguinal approach, microsurgical inguinal, microsurgical subinguinal, laparoscopic, or embolization. So with this, so the conclusion of the review is decreased oxidative stress and sperm DNA fragmentation after varicocele repair and superior cost effectiveness versus IVF ICSI. It says, if you after undergoing varicocele surgery, definitely the oxidative stress and DNA fragmentation will come down. Varicocele repair is a widespread, well-established procedure that can improve seven parameters in men with infertility. In those patients with the borderline, there is a chance that their nature conception can occur. Or if it is very low, then also like if you do ICSI with the sperm, the pregnancy rate will be better. The effect of such treatment on the pregnancy rate is unclear because the evidence is limited due to difficulties in recruiting patients for studies. Among the repair techniques, so I showed you there are so many techniques of which the microsurgical subinguinal technique is the best of all the techniques. Next is another paper, varicoselective may improve results for sperm retrieval and pregnancy rate in non-obstructive azospermic men also. What they have done is the non-obstructive azospermia associated with varicocele and non-obstructive azospermia without varicoceles. Here, what they have done is, they first they did the varicoselectomy. Then after some time, two to three months, they went for the uh, micro TG they did. There, if you see the spontaneous pregnancy, here if it is very, uh, after doing some patient, they conceived spontaneously, around 14% of patients they conceived uh, spontaneously, some required um, by taking the sperm from the testes and the ICSI they conceived. So here the total pregnancy rate is, uh, fertilization rate is 92% and the live birth rate is 23% and pregnancy rate is 36%. So even in non-obstructive azospermia, the varicocele is there, if you do the repair, so the, the sperm retrieval rate also will increase and the live birth rate also will increase here. The conclusion of the study is microsurgical varicocelectomy in non-obstructive azospermia, men may have positive effect on post-operative sperm ejaculate and natural or assistant pregnancies. Both there will be improvement will be there. Meanwhile, sperm retrieval rate and live birth rate was higher in patients with varicocele and non-obstructive azospermia than comparing with without varicocele non-obstructive azospermia. So this is the uh, microscopic subinguinal varicocelectomy. Here the advantage is under magnification, we can identify the veins and the artery. Always many times we may ligate the artery when you are doing macroscopically. Here that problem won't be there. So there won't be any uh, the testicular atrophy. So that is the best thing. And the recurrence rate will be very less. And also the hydrocele formation also is very less with this technique. So if you decide to go for the varicocelectomy, better to go for the microsurgical subinguinal uh, varicocelectomy is the best. Next is, is there any role, is there medical management in the male infertility with idiopathic wards? So there is uh, many papers are there. 
revisiting there is one study here the one commonly used drug is the clomiphene citrate or sometimes tamoxifen otherwise hcg also we will be using here in this paper what they have done is clomiphene citrate 25 mg daily since other group group b they have given 50 mg daily and tamoxifen 20 to 30 mg daily three groups they have divided and they compared the results the conclusion of the study is estrogen antagonists like uh, clomiphene citrate with good safety profile seem to be effective as empiric medical therapy in a subset of idiopathic infertile males the author suggested that use of clomiphene citrate 50 mg than the 25 mg 50 mg is the dose 25 not much or tamoxifen citrate 20 to 30 mg daily for 3 to 6 months is uh, improvement is there if there is no improvement this is an indication to go for the ert next is our role of aromatase inhibitors for male infertility so is there any role is there we will be doing many times the estrogen also will be raised that time if you give clomiphene citrate alone it won't work that's why along with the testosterone if you estimate the estradiol uh, est estrogen also if the ratio is testosterone and estrogen ratio is if it is more than 10 then it is abnormal here here if you start the aromatase inhibitors it is going to help aromatase inhibitors can increase endogenous testosterone production and serum, serum testosterone levels treatment of infertile males with the aromatase inhibitors like testolactone anastrozole and letrozole has been associated with increased sperm production and return of sperm to the ejaculate in sper in men with non obstructive spermia so in non obstructive spermia when there is a variation the ratio is altered so if you start on uh, these drugs like uh, anastrozole 1 mg daily or letrozole 2.5 mg 2.5 mg daily if you continue for 3 to 6 months there is chance is there spontaneous sperm so itself will be there in the uh, semen or if you do the biopsy there also you can get there is very less there is no uh, side effects with this drugs next when it comes to the role of hcg here what they have done is in uh, i told you like in non obstructive azospermia the treatment is going for the micro tg what they have done is here they subject the patients for micro tg those patient who didn't get the sperms in micro tg itself for them they have given the hcg 2000 iu two to three times per week like this for three months then second time they again subjected the uh, these patients for micro tg here they got the sperms the ledic cells of the testes can respond positively to exogenous hcg even under hypergonadotropic conditions hcg based hormonal therapy prior to a second micro tg attempt is effective in men with hypospermatogenesis next when you come to the obstructive azospermia so this is the we have various methods are there so depending upon the thing suppose if you think that is uh, vasal or epididymal or some other place obstruction is there if there is little enlargement is there in the epididymis we can go for the percutaneous uh, epididymal sperm max just give the card block with a gel gelacan then infiltrate locally then take the scalp vein set just aspirate and inject into the media examine under a microscope you can see the sperm motel sperms with this we can use this sperms for directly for xc next is all case sometimes very difficult you may not get if it is not enlarged so here this is also under microscope guidance you can go for the microscopic epididymal sperm inject injection here under microscope just open the Uh, epididymis aspirate the sperms then same they check for the motile sperms use this one for uh, xc next is sometimes if the epididymis is not enlarged you cannot palpate also 
there from test list also you can take direct list from the testicular aspiration of the sperm here just give the card block then uh, give little amount of uh, infiltration in the local infiltration then same way take the scalp vein set you have seen some tissue we got the thing then here just you can uh, desiccate the tissue then examine under microscope you will get sperms suppose if you are not getting here also sometimes previously they had something and this is also very small here then you can go for the testicular extraction of the sperm like biopsy other things also we can do here so take the testicular tissue directly next is desiccate tissue then take this one and examine under microscope you will get the sperms so these cases some people are very particular they want only sperms so that way that time you have to do this one earlier then if the sperms are there you can freeze it then you can uh, go for the stimulation of the wife then you can transfer after fertilization next is in non obstructive spermia these methods all won't work until now we are going for the donor insemination or advising only uh, adoption nowadays we have this micro tz this is the best methods even if the fs is 40 50 is there here if you go for the under microscope just bisect the test is here under microscope you can see here you just see that these are the enlarged tubes you can make out when compared with other tubes from there you can take the tissue and we can check for the sperms if it is there then we can use the same thing so the pregnancy rate after taking from the test is it is almost equal to ejaculated sperm so there is no it won't produce any problems but in non obstructive azoospermia always you have to better to exclude the uh, any chromosomal problems are there or not in micro tz so micro tz is a safe option for treatment of non obstructive azoospermia in men in men who present with infertility however we should caution them always 100% we won't get the sperm from the patient next these are all not working is there any option is there available for us one is like platelet rich plasma so we'll see the effectiveness of autologous platelet rich plasma in the therapy of infertile men with non obstructive azoospermia here what we have done so here if we inject after three to four months there is sperms are seen the conclusion of this study numerous studies have proven prp to have a statistically significant level of regenerative potential in different branches of medicine prp therapy has been successful for the treatment of some causes of female infertility the treatment potential of prp for male infertility may not be underestimated just prepare the prp directly inject into testes they wait for some time if needed like two times or three times should do then you can uh, check for the thing so there is sometimes if there is no uh, we may get the sperms in the ejaculate otherwise do the test for the biopsy then you can get the sperms next is role of stem cell stem cell therapy stem cell therapy revolves around using the patient's own adipose tissue for harvesting cells and this extraction procedure is carried out via liposuction adipose derived stem cells are isolated in the lab later combining these cells with the patient's own platelet rich plasma making a cocktail in order to enhance the effect of the treatment the cocktail is then injected into different areas of the testicles for the effect of the treatment to show it takes a period of about 3 months in a study 50 to 60 uh, 56 to 58% success rate in generating new sperm cells production in cases where the patient had non obstructive azoospermia so they showed there is definitely a pro sperms will be available in these things next is the role of genetic evaluation in male infertility the genetic testing is required whenever the sperm count is less than 5 millions that is an indication for genetic evaluation 
even though there are some problems will be there in normal sperm sperm count is also it will be there it is why we will do the genetic analysis identification of the infertility causes identification of genetic disease transmission to offspring because if it is there like even if you take the sperm from the testes micro tc if there is some problem in there that will be transmitted to the offspring so if you do the testing so you can counsel the patient before itself whether they want to go to their own sperm they want to use or they want to go to the donor sperm so that they can avoid the transmission of the same problem to the child next optimization of the art reproductive techniques suppose if you take the sperm and do like that the pregnancy rate may not be good if you are able to identify before itself you can say the success rate and also you can tell then you can go for the embryo biopsy and you can take the best sperm that not um euploid embryo then the pregnancy rate will improve what are the genetic there are two types of uh, genetic analysis we will be doing one is chromosomal analysis there we can see translocation other things all like that second one is the y chromosome micro deletions so the human y chromosome harbors genes that are responsible for testicular development and also for initiation and maintenance spermatogenesis in adulthood the long of the y chromosome contains many amp amplicone and palindromic sequences making it predisposed to self recombination during spermatogenesis and hence susceptible to intrachromosomal deletions such deletions lead to copy number variation genes of the y chromosome resulting in the male infertility there are three common deletions we can see that is called azf that is azoospermia factor it's called azf a azf b and azf c what is the importance if you see azf a and azf b whatever you do like biopsy if you do micro tc also you won't get sperm at all if there is azf c is there then you will definitely get the sperm that way for counseling purpose and to take the decision earlier itself it will helps us clinically the, the screening of y chromosome micro deletions would aid the clinician it determine the cause of male infertility and decide a racial management strategy for the patient whether to use the same uh, his own sperm or to go for the donor sperm all these deletions are transmitted 100% of male offspring born through art testing of y chromosome micro deletions will allow the couples to make an informed choice regarding the, uh, the whether to go for the uh, donor or their own sperm with the emergent data on association of y chromosome deletions with testicular cancers and neuropsychiatric conditions long term follow up data is needed for infertile men harboring y chromosome deletions so here these patients they have more chance of testicular development uh, cancers and also neuropsychiatric problems so this also we can explain to them but this until now it is not very 100% proved but there is some case increase if found the information will change the current the perspective of androgenetics from infertility and might have broad implications in male health so this is the chromosome the azf a azf b and c the micro deletion will be there present in the long arm of the sperm next is we go to sperm to gonial sperm stem cell transplantation and male infertility so whether we can start, start this spermatogonial stem cells what is the current status and future directions uh, published in arab journal of urology somatic cells may be de differentiated into induced pluripotent stem cells and then reprogram to differentiate through germ cell lineage via transplantation into the testis seminiferous tubules genografting or germ cell germ line stem cells in culture so we can take the sperm uh, sperm cells spermatogonial sperm, uh, stem cells and directly into the inject into the uh, seminiferous tubules then it will be developed into sperms and it will come out so this here you can take the somatic uh, cells or germ cells then somatic cells culture you can do that you can inject into the testis 
or you can culture also separately and that you can inject to the animals also from there so if you inject into test a there will be directly the sperm will be exaggerated in the sperm or you can culture and take the sperms then you can with that you can do the icsi same way germ cells also we can use for the same purpose the conclusion of this study is spermatogonial sperm cells, stem cells show promise for application for future clinical practice research in vitro and in animal or human or animal models of auto allo geno grafting have shown some functional success including production of fertile offspring after culture in animals they have tried in the mouse it is successful there is cause for cautious optimism with significant barriers including concern about carcinogenesis this is the one problem we will be worrying actually stem cell transplantation whether the cells will go continuous to grow and produce cancers that is the one problem we will be facing next is artificial gametes an alternative to sexual reproduction artificial gametes and their implications for society here what is artificial gametes artificial gametes is the term used to refer to cells that can function in the same way as gametes but in which these functions have been reduced by induced biochemically or through surgical intervention on the cell that means any cell you can take that it won't be may not be perfecting uh, functioning normally suppose if you take the cardiac cell that will function is different if you take liver cell that will be different but here biochemically we can make it into cardiac cell into liver cell or liver cell into the germ cell like that we can do that is called artificial gametes in 2003 2004 several papers were published detailing the derivation of gamete type cells obtained from mouse embryonic stem cells in 2004 and 5 further research reported similar findings in human embryonic stem cells since then progress have been made on the development of artificial gametes using a number of different methods fertile mouse offspring have been born from oocyte derived from skin cells not only all those things from skin anybody skin also you can take like this they have done the experiments on the mouse from the, they have taken the mouse skin cell from there they created the artificial germ cells both sperms and oocytes and the mouse were born it may be many years before artificial germ cells are ready for clinical use in humans clearly there are significant expectations that artificial germ gametes can help resolve problems that are currently amenable to existing medical interventions if somatic cells such as skin or blood can be manipulated in the laboratory to fulfill the functions of eggs the burden some aspect of egg collection would be significantly diminished suppose there is no eggs like diminished ovarian reserve or something no need for us even normal patients also if are able to create the eggs from the skin skin cell then no need for us to stimulate the patient all the things just this itself we can take the skin cell and grow it moreover women who have already undergone the menopause would still be able to generate gametes artificially so menopausal ladies also there is chance is that they can conceive with uh, their own gametes so there is a research paper in posted in science and technology by lauren turner in 2018 researcher from koyoto university in japan has found a way to make sperm and egg cells from skin cells the cutting edge technique allows cells to be genetically reset and persuaded to become sex cells otherwise known as gametes this new technique developed by mitori sato and his team could allow new healthy gametes to be made from the patient's own body cells they are able to have children which are biologically theirs either sperm or eggs can be made from individuals individuals regardless of their own biological sex same person male you can both make sperms and also take the cells from the male skin then you can make sperms and also eggs that's the problem meaning there is potential that same sex couples could have children which are genetically related to both parties then we will have problems this technology has been in the making for a relatively long time in 2007 chiano yanaka discovered that adult cells could be reprogrammed to become unspecialized stem cells which can then become any other cell type by adding specific proteins as reprogramming factors these stem cells 
are known as induced pluripotent stem cells. The team were able to take skin cells from a mouse and transform them into induced pluripotential, pluripotential stem cells. They then added transcription factors to turn the cells into Hugonia cells, which can be divided into form egg cells. By growing these cells with cells taken from a mouse ovary, they were able to make the cells divide and become fully functional egg cells capable of making healthy mouse embryos. In 2011, the team successfully created artificial mouse sperm cells by transplanting the cells into mouse testes to cause them to develop. Even though this technique has many excited about the new possibilities, some are concerned about the ethics of the process. Some speculate that it is combined with genetic screening. There is a risk people will use it to select genetically allied embryos. So they want everybody will be genius like that. So then they can go for this type of problem. Additionally, there are some unsettling concerns of the result of the process as it creates a possibility of a unibaby with both the sperm and the egg being created from the same person. Cells could also be easily obtained from an individual without consent and use it to create an embryo. So just like a person is there just scratching itself, you can take some cell like some cells that you can use to create the thing. Then this way also we can we will have problem. These are complex ethical concerns which need to be considered before this technique is applying clinically. In the years to come, there is a potential for the creation of artificial gametes to put an end to the world's fertility problems. But for now, people remain undecided whether this is an exciting leap forward or the start of a terrifying reproductive apocalypse. In conclusion, male infertility is a global health issue which is increasing in incidence in the world scenario. Incidence is higher in developing countries. Research in genetics, proteomics has opened new issues in the management of so-called idiopathic infertility. Still, there is need for further research into underlying etiology and treatment of male infertility. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the excellent presentation and a lot of uh, recent uh, data and very uh, recent publications uh, you have shared. It's very useful to the doctors, for the practicing doctors. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are comments as well uh, by the doctor that the talk was very wonderful and nice data. Uh, so can I take a few questions now? Yes, yes. Right. Uh, the first question is uh, from Dr. Bhavna, and the question is, uh, in case of uh, grade one uh, varicosis, what is the role of uh, surgery? Okay. See, if it, the indication for the, even if the sperm, uh, semen analysis is normal, if you grade two, grade three, like clinically visible thing, we will be advising varicosis if after excluding all other causes from the female and male also. Suppose if the patient is having uh, like uh, sperm abnormality words is there. Then even if it is grade one, it is advisable to do varicoselectomy. Then they have seen the improvement in the uh, sperm parameters. If it is associated with, there is some problem is that then only we like the grade, grade one varicosil associated with some problems like uh, words. Uh, right, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so there are again a lot of comments so that the talk was uh, wonderful and excellent from Dr. Asha Rao, Dr. Murugan. Uh, so one uh, question is there uh, from Dr. Janani. The question is, how long after PRP infusion we have to repeat uh, hormone therapy? Usually it takes a minimum three months. Suppose if it's not improved, we can wait another um, <clears throat> four to six weeks also. So usually we can see the re results after three months, three to six months. By that time, we will know whether this patient is going to respond to your treatment or not. Uh, right, so thank you. So there is a question from Dr. Natvajan. In India, do we have artificial gamut facility? And no, that... it's not there, not. Uh... Okay, okay, right. Uh, so the next question is from Dr. Arjee Hanesh. How long to give FCG therapy and what is the 
actually is you know any treatment you want to go for the male thing it takes minimum 76 days for the sperm to develop on cow so minimum 3 months by that to that just you can check the thing if there is any development if there is some improvement is you continue the same treat for 6 months if you continue for 6 months there is no improvement there is no difference then no point in this that treatment is failure so minimum 6 months you have to continue 3 to 6 months continue right sir thank you uh so next question is uh, from dr arshun saab if count is 5 million uh, should we go for iui said count all in that we have to see the motility also total motile sperm count is important just here there how much it is there minimum 3 million sabo is there there is a chance is there but the when compared with other about 10 million total metal sperm count is better five also you can try up to 3 million is okay less than that is not advisable better to go for the grt right Uh, sir, is there any technique to uh, identify or to take out uh, good quality sperms uh, as far as IUI is concerned, and its uh, application? IUI, see, there are so many sperms will be there. Only technique what you can do there is uh, uh, density density gradient method of sperm preparation is slightly better than other things. We map other things, but uh, the papers are showing like that not much different. but when compared with that very few percent also 2% 5% also is better means go for that way there is nothing like that we can identify this only for ixi purpose like that you can say here all the sperms will be there we are going to get all motile sperms so that only preparation method we can say otherwise we cannot uh... thank you uh, so next question is uh, from dr mohan sir uh, if uh, only motility is low but the count is good and patient doesn't have varicose veins then how to investigate we have to see whether there is any infection is there that's the one thing send the semen for or agglutination also is there anti sperm antibodies also is there that way any other factors other factors that can affect like obesity also can affect that thing all this thing that we have to identify and exclude that factors then even if it is not there give a course of antibiotic like doxycycline at least 2 weeks then repeat after one month we will know like whether this uh, rarely it is there uh, there is any improvement is there or not if the count is very high even if the uh, motility is low sometime there is a chance is there that patient can uh, uh next i told you like you no know, this ox uh, sperm dna fragmentation index we can estimate all these things so if you are able to correct there is a chance is there otherwise still it is not uh, improving then we have to say that microscopic uh, things that all we cannot make out by electronic microscope studies only we can make out the defects in the structural defects so there we have to go for only for the ixi thank you sir uh, so again lot of comments for a nice presentation excellent talk and uh, i'm still waiting for some more questions So, so one question is again from dr santa is uh, letrozole or clomip in which is better letrozole letrozole or clomip in a cycle so no see clomiphene is the drug of choice for giving for the idiopathic thing when you will go for the letrozole and anastrozole if the ratio testosterone and estradiol ratio is altered usually like uh, if the estradiol Uh, level C is very high. There, even if you give clomiphene alone, it's not going to going to work. There, to uh, like uh, correct that one, both clomiphene and anastrozole one milligram daily, or letrozole two point five milligram daily combined together, you can give. Then it will improve. It reduces the yeast dial level, so the testosterone levels will be increased. That way, it will help. Uh, thank you, sir. uh so i don't see uh, uh, more question uh so one one more question is there so can i take that question yes yes okay. uh what is the role of medical management in idiopathic semen uh, which one to use i think oligosperm okay that's what we have to exclude our idiopathic just we can try here only medical management so we, we we should counsel the patient saying definitely we cannot guarantee you like 100% improvement but we can 
try for three months minimum. So here 25 milligrams clomiphene citrate of water I will be giving for 25 days in a month, five days break, then again like this, so you have to continue for three months. Sometimes if you have that, uh, that depends upon whether the FSH levels also you have to check. If it is slightly low, then supplement HCG also, 2000 IU twice a week, this is also for along with that one for three months. Then just check the semen analysis. At the same time, the serum testosterone level should not cross 800 nanograms. That also you have to see. And also it should not be very low also. This way if you monitor, there is a chance that it can improve. If it is improving, continue this one for six months, then the improvement will be there. If it is not improving, then no point in continuing again beyond six months in these patients. Right, sir. So again, a uh, question from uh, same doctor, Dr. Raikokar. So uh, what is better? I mean, what is your recommendation other than uh, clomiphene and uh, your opinion about uh, antioxidants? Well, antioxidants, see here, uh, other things like clomiphene, other things, hormonal things that can create problems for a long time when you're using without thing. Here, antioxidants, by giving three to four months is not going to create any problem. At the same time, if you get some benefit, that is better. Suppose if you were able to identify if their DNA fragmentation is very high, even uh, that is not there, if you are not able to test, antioxidants, you can continue. This is not going to create any problem to the patient. At the time, there is a chance is there, it can help the patient. Giving is not a problem. It is not the wrong. Continue for three to four months. Right, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I don't see uh, uh, any more questions uh, in the chat box. So I will say thank you uh, uh, again and again. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. So my question is, uh, can we share your presentation with the uh, uh, doctor? Uh, so that's my question. Yes, no problem. You can share, no problem. Yes, sir, thank you. So we have done the recording and we will be sharing this presentation. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, sir. For that. Thank you, nice Dr. Tachi, for, for managing this uh, nicely. Thank you, Mr. Balaji. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you. Okay, okay.